factor. Okay, let's talk about um, energy exchanges. First of all, it's in, this is an important chapter. Like why means? Uh, because chemical reactions always have heat changes. Always, always. You cannot have a chemical reaction without some form of um, heat evolved or absorbed or heat moving. There's always going to be heat. So topic five is really just learning about what's happening with the heat changes during a chemical reaction, okay? So before we start, let's talk about substances first. Let's talk about your reactants and products. Um, looking back to, you know, those lab calculations that you did. Um, so yeah, Ariel was just talking about potassium hydroxide and nitrous acid, nitrous or nitric, nitrous, nitrous? Nitrous. HNO2? Yeah. Okay. So those substances, like as a molecule, as a molecule, they have potential energy, chemical potential energy. Where does that energy come from? Because they have bonds and we learned about you no know, bond enthalpy. So we know that if a molecule have bonds there, and if we break those bonds or if we form those bonds, it will carry with it some potential energy. Okay, They have potential energy because they have bonds. If they don't have bonds, they don't have potential energy. All substances will have potential energy, whether it's covalent, ionic, metallic bonds. They all have bonds there, right? All substances will have bonds. So in short, all substances have potential energy. Okay. And all substances also, this nitrous acid, this potassium hydroxide, will have kinetic energy. And when we talk about kinetic energy, we talk about temperature. So all substances will have their own temperature. And when you measure their temperature, you're just basically talking about uh, the movement of those molecules. All substances will have temperature. It's impossible for molecules to have zero temperature. Uh, zero absolute temperature basically don't exist because molecules will always vibrate. There's always going to be some form of movement. Okay. So there, the substance potential energy plus the substance kinetic energy is equals, equals to the substance's enthalpy, heat content. And then your book went on and on about, about like difference of temperature and heat. It's kind of like, Okay, let me simplify. Temperature, you're measuring the average kinetic energy. When you say enthalpy of the substance, you take into consideration its temperature plus its potential energy in its bonds. So enthalpy is you're talking about the heat. Um, yeah, that's a bad example. Anyway, so all substances will have enthalpy. Are you with me? All substances. Why, miss? Because all substances have bonds. All substances, as molecules, are constantly moving. There's like vibration. There's kinetic energy. So all substances will have enthalpy. Here's a million dollar question, which here, miss, I'm not asking it. Anyway, so enthalpy of substances cannot be measured. You cannot measure the enthalpy of potassium hydroxide. You cannot measure the enthalpy of nitrous acid. It's, it's, there's no way to be able to measure both the potential energy and kinetic energy. So you need to measure the substance's enthalpy when it's in a chemical reaction. When you put it in a chemical reaction, you can measure how its enthalpy changes. You're like, wait, 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 miss, wait, okay. Let's go back to heat here, heat. Heat is a form of energy, right? It's, this is in your book. I like how your book says here. Heat is a form of energy that is transferred from a warmer body to a cooler body. Heat is actually, there has to be a flow. You, are you with me? Heat is a flow of energy. So if you just have one substance, how do you know the flow? Are you, you get it? Simple. Simple as that. Because you don't know how it flows, but, but, but you know it has to have enthalpy. Then what you do is you put it in a chemical reaction and you see how its enthalpy, how its heat flows in the chemical reaction. Okay, so you cannot directly measure enthalpy of substances. Because when you talk about enthalpy of substances, you're talking about flow of heat. How can it flow if it's, you're not comparing it with anything. It's just the substance. 
So what you do is you react it with another substance, and then you try to determine the flow of heat. What happens now to its enthalpy? Okay, so we can indirectly measure the enthalpy of substances when we put them, when we react them with other substances. Potassium hydroxide on its own, we know it has enthalpy, but okay, how do we determine its enthalpy? We can, we need some form of flow. Okay, let's react it with nitrous acid and then let's see um, what happens to its temperature changes. If the temperature starts changing, you know heat is flowing from one body to another. So we have to put them in a chemical reaction so that we can know what's happening to them, what's happening to their energy as it reacts. Okay, that's it. That's basically it. So, yeah, I've been talking a lot. I'm just saying you can't measure it directly, so you react it. When you react it with other substances, here's what you do. You, you monitor the change in temperature. Okay, temperature will be changing. Why will temperature be changing? Ugh, I'm just saying warm will move to cool, cooler object, right? There's always going to be some movement of heat now once they're reacting. So when they're reacting, either energy is absorbed from the surrounding, your book is surrounding in system, or energy will be released to its surrounding. So as they're reacting, they're absorbing or they're releasing heat. So you monitor those absorbing and releasing heat in the surrounding and monitor its temperature change. Okay. So um, in other words, you cannot know enthalpy without putting it in a chemical reaction. You need to react it. And then during the reaction, you monitor, you follow, you follow how temperature changes. That way you can calculate what's going on with the heat. What's happening to the heat as, you know, you have these temperature changes. Now, that's why um, whenever you see the word enthalpy, we're not talking about the substance, we're actually talking about enthalpy changes. When I say the enthalpy of a reaction, it's always the changes. I can't say enthalpy of sodium chloride, enthalpy of oxygen. It's always like enthalpy of methane when it reacts with oxygen, like that. It has to be in a chemical reaction. And um, yeah, when we look at those substances now, again, we have to react those substances. Um, we need to make sure that we're reacting them in a controlled temperature, pressure, and we know their concentration, we know their states, because all of these will affect uh, the enthalpy change. Okay, these factors will affect the enthalpy change. So when we're trying to look at enthalpy changes of chemical reactions, we have to make sure that we're looking at the same thing. These are chemical reactions that we always do under standard conditions. Temperature being about 20 something room temperature degree Celsius or 298 Kelvin, pressure being 1.1 kilopascals. And we always consider whether they are reacting in their standard state. Okay? So if all else is controlled, if these are all controlled, then we have one standard of measuring enthalpy changes. So if you measure enthalpy change of nitrous acid and what is it? Potassium hydroxide here on Earth. Okay, good. You're doing it under standard temperature and pressure. You go outside in outer space, that's going to give you a different enthalpy change. Why, Miss? Because temperature has changed. Pressure has changed. I remember when I went to NASA, you were talking about like how the flame here, our flame looks like yellow and blue. When you go there, you burn the same substance, you see red or green. You're like, what's happening there to the heat? It's different now. You're not doing the experiment under standard temperature and pressure. So when you look at all calculations for enthalpy change, keep in mind that to consider that they're all in their standard temperature and pressures. Okay. 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 What was I? Why did I talk about that? Uh, again, substances don't you cannot directly measure their enthalpy. So what do we do? We react. Them. We put them in a chemical reaction. And if we put them in a chemical reaction, we all have to make sure that the chemical reaction happens in standard temperature and pressure. Okay. Because if it's a different temperature or pressure, it's going to be a different temperature change. It's going to be a different enthalpy calculation. Um, all right. So that's it. I'll just add a system and surrounding here, right here, maybe in your notebook. Talk about system and surrounding. Um, I found this chart, just if you want to be, if you want to like think more about temperature and heat, 
can have a look at this. I think physics, you're going to have to study this. Or did, maybe you studied it already. I'm not sure. Um, heat is a form of energy. Temperature is not a form of energy. Okay? It's not a form of energy. It's just uh, measuring the movement of the molecules, average kinetic energy. Um, heat transfer is a reason behind temperature change. I wanna, do I want to say that again? That's why we cannot measure enthalpy of a substance. Nothing is happening. If you react it with something, then heat is going to start moving. Heat is going to start to transfer. Then you can monitor the transfer, the movement of heat by looking at the temperature changes. Okay. I got it, miss. Very good. Um, what else do I want? Here again. It flows. Heat flows. Temperature, no, you're just looking at the movement of the molecules. Um, anyway, so you can have a look at the listing there, just talking about heat and temperature. Uh, what you need to know really is that, I, here, 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 number two, heat transfer is the reason behind temperature change. When you say temperature, heat, they're different. And we're talking about enthalpy, we're talking about heat heat transfers, flow of energy. And we know that heat transfers flow of energy, you can't measure it directly on a substance. So you put it in a chemical reaction and you look at heat is transferred. Now, how do I how do I monitor heat transfer? Look at temperature change. That's it. At standard temperature and pressure. Okay. Questions so far. Okay, let's go to change in enthalpy now. So, as we have said, because you cannot measure directly the enthalpy of a substance, you react it. And during a chemical reaction, you look at the change in enthalpy. How do you measure that again? I just said, look at the temperature changes, okay? And that will give you an idea of like the enthalpy of the substance. The substance that's in the chemical reaction. So change in enthalpy, we usually use this sign, delta H, delta H, yeah, delta H. So change in enthalpy. Um, we look at the enthalpy, uh, the heat changes or the movement of these heat during a chemical reaction when we're reacting our products and our reactants under standard temperature and pressure. So we monitor the heat changes as our products are formed, as our reactants are broken under standard temperature and pressure. Now, um, this is, um, yeah, you're a genius, you can handle this. Okay, this is kind of like in the book, I wanna clarify. Endothermic process is the process of breaking bonds. It, uses energy from the surrounding. It gets the energy from the surrounding to break the bonds. Okay, that's easy, miss. All right. Other process is exothermic process. Exothermic process is when you're forming bonds, when you form the bonds, psh, my lovely sound effect. When you form the bonds, psh, there's um, heat that is released from the system into its immediate surrounding. Okay, got it. Please don't confuse that with exothermic reaction and endothermic reaction, okay? For example, um, for example, nitrous acid again, plus KOH produces water. And what is this? K, K and, what's the other product area? Water and? Uh, K and O2. Potassium nitrite, nitrite. Okay, so on, so, 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 so. okay. In this chemical reaction, do I have an endothermic process? My breaking bonds. Yeah. Which, which, where reactants or product side? Oh. Uh, reactant. Here. So in this chemical reaction, there's an endothermic process. Why, Miss? For this chemical reaction to occur, I need to break those bonds here in my reactants first, correct? So it's an endothermic process. Process. 
How about this one in the forming of forming of these new bonds in H2O and can KNO2? What are we doing here? We are forming bonds, so it's an exothermic process, correct? So in any in all chemical reactions, you're gonna have both endothermic process and exothermic process. Got it? Okay. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. In some chemical reactions, the energy needed to break, the energy needed for the endothermic process is much higher than the energy released by the exothermic process. So the chemical reaction that both have endothermic and exothermic process is an endothermic reaction. Did you follow that? This is endothermic process. I need to break the bonds. This is exothermic process because when I'm forming bonds, I release heat. But for some chemical reactions, the endothermic process absorbs more energy than the energy released by the exothermic process. Those chemical reactions are uh, those chemical reactions are endothermic reactions. Okay. Um, I'm emphasizing that just, just so, so it's, it's clear in your brain. When you say exothermic reaction, we're just not talking about bonds forming. You know what I mean? We still need to break bonds. In Ariel's case here, the, is this what, what's your delta H, your temperature change? Negative? I mean, you didn't calculate yet, but for neutralization, is it negative or positive delta H? What happened to the temperature? Did it go up or down? Area it went up. It went up. It's exothermic. But does it mean it's only exothermic process? There was also endothermic process right there to break the bonds there. However, in, her, in the neutralization reaction, the energy formed by forming the bonds is much higher. There's more heat release. So yes, it has endothermic process. Yes, it has exothermic process, but there's more heat released by the exothermic process. So the chemical reaction is an exothermic reaction. Got it? That, that's it, that's it. Always think all chemical reactions, there's endother endo endothermic process, exothermic process, and then you look at the overall heat change. If there's more heat released, by forming the products, then the heat absorbed by breaking your products, it means overall the chemical reaction is exothermic. Yes, that's what I want to clarify. Now, endothermic chemical reactions and N exothermic chemical reactions, um, we can plot them in an energy profile graph to visualize what's happening to the enthalpy, enthalpy of the substance before the reaction, so enthalpy of the reactants, then the enthalpy of the product, okay? So if it's an overall endothermic chemical reaction, by the way, you need to draw these graphs. Uh, you need to put those labels, and you're like, oh, miss, that's so easy. It's just a mountain, yeah, okay, very good. So the heat or the enthalpy of the reactant is lower than the and final enthalpy of the product, okay? So put this higher right there. That's the energy profile, energy diagram of an endothermic reaction. And then you put your mountain right there, and then make sure you um, plot in the energy of activation. You're like, what's that, miss? That's new, or you know that already in bio. What is enervation? Activation energy, you, the energy needed to start a reaction. But then your notebook, if it's not there, EA, energy of activation. So all chemical reaction needs an EA. You need to reach this amount of energy first before the reaction can proceed, okay? Energy of activation. So if chem, uh, chemical reactions have high EA, it doesn't proceed spontaneously. It's hard. It, the, the chemical reaction doesn't happen right away. 
because the EA is really high. Okay, that's actually an abstract uh, concept that we use to explain chemical reactions. We try to explain that all chemical reactions will not proceed easily. There's going to be some amount of energy needed first um, to start the reaction. So if the energy of your overall system exceeds that, like right here, if you exceed the energy of activation, then the reaction can proceed. In your book, this is labeled, uh, what is it? Reaction pathway. Okay. If your energy is just here, there's no, there's not going to be any chemical reaction. There has to be th that much energy first before the reaction can go on, can proceed. Uh, let's think of the nitrous acid now, but that's exothermic. What's the example in our book for endothermic? Ammonium nitrate. Okay, when the solid dissolves in water to form aqueous ammonium, no, 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 the reaction requires heat to proceed. Why did I read that? It requires what? Heat to proceed. Why does it need heat? Can't it just happen, miss? It happens, miss, right there. Oh, look, it, the cold pack became cold. Yeah, but before that happened, some heat was removed from the surrounding. Why do you need that heat? Hello, right here. What is that? There, 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 there. Activation energy. You need energy from the outside so you can reach that. If that's not provided, if that's not available, the reaction will not, nothing's going to happen. So, so before the reaction can proceed, it needs some energy from the environment first to overcome, overcome energy of activation. What happens when this system absorbs? Oh, I can concentrate. What happens when your system that's reacting, when it absorbs energy from the outside? What, what do they use those energy for? Well, they orient themselves. They try to collide. They collide, they try to orient themselves, then they, then, they, then they start breaking bonds. Miss, why do they need to break bonds? Because children, if they break their bonds there, there's going to be electrons exposed now. Those electrons can be shared with other atoms from another substance. You break those bonds, you expose the, all of their um, electrons. They're free to reorganize themselves. They're free to like match with other atoms. And how are they able to break those bonds? <laughs> they absorbed energy from their surrounding. And if they have enough energy from their surrounding, they overcome the required minimum. By the way, yeah, what is the actual definition? I need the word minimum. The minimum amount of energy required for a chemical reaction to proceed. Okay, Minimum, just add the word minimum there. So this is the energy profile diagram for endothermic reactions. And this is the energy profile diagram for exothermic reactions. Notice how this is the energy of your reactant. And this is the energy of the product. So the product has lower enthalpy. <gasps> Where did the its energy go? Oh, to its surrounding. That's why the surrounding became hot. Okay. And then you draw the same thing. It will also have energy of activation. Both of them will need energy of activation. Where will the energy of activation come from here? Again, from the surrounding. Miss, it needs? Yes. Why? Miss, because you also need to break bonds. Both endo and exo needs to break bonds. So both endo and exo will get it from its surrounding. Why, Miss? To overcome the energy of activation. You get, you get me from this point to this point. Wait, give me one minute, okay? Now, let's proceed with the chemical reaction. So both of them used energy from their surrounding to overcome the energy of activation. There's enough energy now. They have enough energy to break their bonds. The reaction can proceed, can continue. The reaction proceeds, things will happen. La, 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 la. We don't know what's happening here in the la, 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 la. We don't know. In fact, we don't care. We don't care, miss. Yes. 
Page three, three, 141. Top paragraph. What does it say when you're reading? I don't know if you understood what it says there. The la 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 here doesn't matter. We don't care what happens during the chemical. We don't care. We just want to see what's the final there. There. We just want to see the final. Uh, because I think, yeah, um, HLs, we will learn this. Some chemical reactions are like this. Something. Oh, Christine, bio, enthalpy. We've looked at this in metabolism. Like there's, uh, what is, when we talk about metabolism, there's like a lot of chemical reactions. So we're like, there's like different pathways, even different enzymes. We really don't care. We just want to know what's the initial, what's the final. You're like, miss, but you don't know the initial. There's no value there. There's also no value here. Oh, you're right. So how can I measure it right here? Temperature change. Do you follow? I don't know this, and I don't know this, right? I don't know this. But I know the change. I know the temperature changes. So this, I can get that by monitoring temperature changes. Okay. Mm. So where what? I lost myself. Mm. So we have what we call an energy profile. It shows us. You can visualize what's happening to an endothermic reaction, okay, and an exothermic reaction. So endothermic reaction, we can visualize that this is the enthalpy of the reactant. Things happen, and then they have higher energy, the energy reaction proceed, and now this is the final enthalpy of the products. Because how do we know that? Because when you measure this, guys, there, the environment becomes cold the surrounding is colder which but just basic exothermic exothermic reaction the environment became hot why did it become hot because there's this excess heat that was released to the surrounding the products have a very low enthalpy now where did where did its enthalpy go surrounding how did you know temperature increased this is, ah, okay, okay, okay. Let's make this a little bit more practical, relatable. So we've seen the enthalpy diagrams already. Check for endo and exo. Um, both of them have energy of activation. Check, right? Both of them have energy of activation. For endothermic reactions, I've emphasized that it has higher energy of activation. I drew it earlier, right? There's higher mounting, like from here to here. Different color, here to here. <laughs> there, I know. You can't see it anymore, it's smudged all over it. Let's erase. Okay, let's look at it again. Here's the energy of activation for endo. It has a really high energy of activation. So those chemical reactions does not per, per, proceed spontaneously. It's hard. It needs to absorb a lot of heat from its environment first. How about for exothermic? Look, right there. Lower energy of activation. Small, what do I have here? Small activation energy. It means you don't really need a lot of energy to break the bonds and start the reaction. And you're like, Miss, you said you're trying to make it practical. Yes, because I want to talk about, I want to talk about, I want to talk about bombs. TNT, dynamite. It's funny. I searched last night dynamite and then BTS came out. I'm like, I'm talking about nitroglycerin, decomposition of nitroglycerin. So I have to put uh, dynamite uh, chemical re reaction equation. You try, you put dynamite as BTS. No, 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 no. We're chemists. We're not interested in them. Oh. We can be. There's some of their sounds are really nice. Where was I? Oh, okay. If you compare these two, so this is phosphorus oxide. It, look at this, it, it 
spontane it forms spontaneously when phosphorylated. Okay, again, again, again. This is an exothermic energy profile for the formation of phosphorus five oxide. This is phosphorus five oxide. Now, how does it form? Phos elemental phosphorus, look at that, reacts with oxygen. Really small amount of energy. What does this mean? Psh, easily. You don't know what I'm talking about once upon a time. Have you seen those um, old matchsticks with like red head, then wooden stick? That's um, the uh, phosphorus of different forms. That's the not, that's the, you search it. There's white phosphorus, there's red phosphorus. White, pho you, once upon a time we use white phosphorus, but it burns quickly, like it ignites easily. Like if you bump the powder, like you just bump it, the molecules react with the air. <laughs> It can blow up. So they have to replace those white phosphorus with the rest red phosphorus, red form of the phosphorus. Red, red phosphorus is not as um, combustible than the white phosphorus. Miss, what are you talking about? That phosphorus, you just react it with air. Actually, movement, vibration, the, the powder with the air, it's going to ignite. You can search it on your own. That's why um, like chemical plants, if they have phosphorus, they have to make sure that I don't know if I'm, I'm remembering this correctly. Like some of them needs to store it underwater to prevent it from reacting with air because it can spontaneously combust, spontaneously. And you're like, it just burns me? Yes, it has a very low energy of activation. It doesn't require a lot of energy from its surrounding. It can just bump into oxygen, boom, explosion. Yeah. And yeah, speaking of that, in honor of Alfred Nobel. Let's talk about him, Nobel, Alfred Nobel. He donated a large amount of money when he died. I think that's why he became so popular. But anyway, so Alfred Nobel, um, go ahead and have a read there. Is that too small? Okay, so that is the story of, you're gonna light me up like dynamite. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You're talking about nitroglycerin and its decomposition and the energy of activation is very, we actually don't know why it's so unstable, but we know that it can decompose quickly, um, producing all kinds of gases, CO2, oxygen there. So we have a large amount of gases expanding in the air, like suddenly large amounts of gases that's where the explosion is coming from. Like lots lots of gases pushing through the air like that. Sometimes the explosion is so big, the, the pressure change reaches your ears and you hear like <clears throat> after an explosion, like you know, K-drama, maybe uncanny encounter, explosion, boom. And then no sounds. And then like total silence. And like acting is like this. Really, total silence, what? It pushed your eardrum. The pressure is so high, it pushed it onto your ears. Where's the pressure coming from? That sudden large volumes of gases from the decomposition of dynamite. Anyway, so that's not the point. The point is it's really exothermic, plus it's so unstable, meaning the chemical reaction will just proceed quickly, easily. Ah, oh, the same thing with the phosphorus. I was talking about the fertilizers. Um, what was it? There, a small bump can cause it to explode. It's too, well, anyway, when you look back into its energy profile, it's referring back here to its energy of activation. Because it's so small, it's so easy for the reaction to proceed. So it will ignite, it will combust. So maybe we can tell BTS to change their lyrics and talk about, you know, you're lighting up like a dynamite because the energy of activation is low. You don't need a lot of it. The reaction can proceed. Now, the concept is similar to how do we explain like TNT, explosives, all your other explosives. They have a low energy of activation. Um, You know the grenade, hand grenade, or like all those gunpowders. I'm not familiar with explosive. Like you just throw it, you throw it, and when it lands onto a surface, like the vibration, something, 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 and then you have a chain reaction, and your extra energy activation is low, and then it explodes. Okay, so anyway, why did I talk about that? Just so you'll remember 
that exothermic reactions, like those that burn, those that ignite, those that explode, they're exothermic and they have a much lower energy of activation compared to endothermic reactions. Endothermic reactions, they also can still proceed. They still happen, but they have to absorb this much energy first. Okay. Um, let's just read this. What does it say there? The formation of nitrous oxide from atmospheric nitrogen and oxygen has very large activation energy, resulting in a slow rate of reaction at room temperature. So we don't usually, you know, like that there's nitrogen in the air, there's oxygen in the air, but we don't usually form this. Where does this form? How does this form? Can you quickly verify with me? Um, burning fuel, nitrous oxide. See if there's a chemical reaction there, please. So in your vehicle exhaust, it that heat from your engine or from your, from your exhaust, that heat will provide the energy for your nitrogen to combine with oxygen to form nitrous oxides. So in your cars, we usually put catalytic converters because we don't want nitrogen to react with oxygen to form nitrous oxides. Miss Y, well, there's, that's an environmental pollutant. It can cause acid rain. It also can cause, um, this is also a greenhouse. So anyway, what I'm just saying is if there's no car, if there's no hot engine, nitrogen in your gas, in your air, will not readily combine with oxygen. No, it needs a lot of energy before it can produce this poisonous gas, nitrous oxide. Um, jet fuel, let me check. Jet fuel, airplane, nitrous oxide. Uh, okay. Um, yes. I don't know. I'm just thinking about jet fuel because these aircrafts, okay, the engine also when they burn jet fuel, it gets really hot. So they're when they're burning their jet fuel up there in the atmosphere, their machines are really hot. The nitrogen and the oxygen in the air up there will start to form nitrous oxides. Okay? It's just basically like a consequence consequence of uh burning of jet fuels you have that environment where the machine is hot those nitrogen oxygen will start combining yeah okay what else did i want to talk about so that's nobel thank you we found a, a more stable way for the decomposition of the dynamite and then so here we are now I talk a lot, but I just want to wrap our brains around this one again. Enthalpy change of a reaction. Um, this is what we need to measure the enthalpy changes because we cannot measure the enthalpy of the substance directly. We react them and then we look at what's happening to its immediate surrounding. Is there a change in temperature? Is the temperature going up or going down? If temperature is going down, then we know it's endothermic. We know that the heat is going into the system, so the so the product will have higher enthalpy than the reactant. Oh, I also want to mention this. This is in your book. Because, there again, because the, the enthalpy diagram for endothermic reaction looks like this right here. So the product still has a lot of energy. Where did it get it from? The surrounding, remember, surrounding got cold, the heat went to your product. So the products will have, the products are said to be more um, unstable. Unstable in what sense? Because it has a higher energy, um, it has a higher enthalpy. There's still energy in your products compared to your exothermic uh, reaction. The products are stable. They don't have a lot of energy anymore. Where did the energy go to their surrounding? So just talking about stability, the products of endothermic are unstable. The products of exothermic chemical reactions are stable. There's not a lot of energy in the substances anymore. 
Okay, so again, cannot we can only indirectly measure enthalpy changes, and there's so many kinds of chemical reactions. So I'm just listing here again things that you already know. So um, I don't know the enthalpy of an acid or the base, but I can react them and measure the enthalpy of neutralization. When I mix them, I monitor I monitor the heat, the heat change of the solution. And then I just divide that by the mole of my limiting reactant. And now I have the enthalpy of this chemical reaction. How about this chemical reaction? Well, there's different ways to do it. First, you can do it in the lab using a calorimeter, which is prone to a lot of errors, right? We talk about heat losses. Um, but you can also do enthalpy of combustion under standard temperature and pressure. So scientists do this, and then they have a standardized um, amount of energy when you combust different moles of different kinds of organic molecules. This, this is in your data booklet. We find this under enthalpy of combustion. Or we can, again, we can indirectly look at the heat changes just by looking at their bond enthalpies or their enthalpy of formation. This is indirect. Okay. Now, there are some chemical reactions um, when you put, sorry, there are chemical reactions when you put solids or liquids in water. It also generates uh, heat. There's going to be temperature changes. So we calculate that at, as enthalpy of aqueous in aqueous solutions. Same thing, we look at the heat change of the aqueous solution in your water, and then you divide it by the mole of the substance that you mix there in your water. This is only three. There's a lot more chemical reactions, right? It's different kinds of chemical reactions. Um, so you only have to know these three. Aqueous solutions, combustion, and neutralization. Again, this is why we're doing this again. <laughs> because we cannot measure the enthalpy of your substance. We can Okay, my dog said you have a guys have a brain break. Um, one of the females is having an extra cycle, so really the boys are fighting over her biology. Ah, where am I? So, yeah, I'll repeat myself over and over and over and over again. You cannot measure the enthalpy of a substance, so we measure it indirectly by reacting them, and we look at the temperature changes so we can know the heat changes as well. Okay, that's it. That's basically it. Um, yes. Okay. Um, page two, please. I have some calculation questions here. This is actually calcul not really the concepts that we've learned. It's okay. Um, the first one is, let's see if you can remember how to do, and there'll be changes of neutralization. Um, you did that in the lab, so that should be easy. Number two, though, please uh, look with me on this graph. This is what I explained to you last time. Like, you can never know the temperature at time zero. It didn't happen yet. So you can just look back and extrapolate. Um, this is an example of mixing zinc in copper sulfate. Okay? Mixing zinc in copper sulfate is an ex exothermic reaction. How do we know? Because if you look at the graph... This is the initial temperature of copper sulfate. That's the solution. When you mix the zinc, uh, using your thermometer, you see that the temperature shoots up. So you know it's exothermic reaction, right? 
And then um, after the chemical reaction, of course, it's going to cool down. It's going to equilibrate with the temperature again of the surrounding. But then if you know the steady decrease of the temperature there, you can extrapolate. You use your ruler. You can put it on your screen if you want. So you can extrapolate back. What could have been the highest temperature here at time zero? What could have been the highest temperature? Again, extrapolate the line all the way to the y-intercept. What could have been the highest temperature? So that will be your final temperature minus initial temperature. That's the temperature change, okay? We didn't do a simulation lab for that, but I'm explaining how you can extrapolate exothermic data from like graphs like this. Um, and then number three, this is combustion. Still remember how to do it. This was our lab, the first lab where I taught you how to calculate it for methanol, ethanol, and propanol. So calculation for that. And then this is from our lesson, enthalpy level diagrams. Um, Notice here on this enthalpy level diagram, you don't, it doesn't show you the energy of activation, right? There's no energy of activation. This just shows you um, enthalpy of the reactants, enthalpy of the products. That's okay. It's all right. It just means they didn't show you, but every reaction will have an energy of an activation. Don't look for it here. Um, but anyways, it's going to talk, it's going to ask you questions about this uh, diagram right here number two can you please just distinguish uh, rephrase that please can you distinguish um i don't like that question uh change this question to distinguish between uh temperature and heat i'd like that better i don't want you to remember that what's the difference between temperature and heat yes and then i talk about stability all right open your worksheets and your notebooks work with me while I'm here, if you want, you can do your rough formula and then you can check with me the formula already and then you just calculate later. But again, number one, neutralization. Number two, aqueous solution. Number three, combustion reactions.